Okay, so if you haven't already, it would be a really good idea to make sure that you have the Biology 101 shell in your Canvas. So you can log into Canvas and you should have um, the course and you can just click on it. And remember that um, there um, from here, you can find the online textbook and it's working today. So the online textbook looks something like this, right? And you can go to contents and we will be um, talking about um, um, genetic, not genetics, we'll be talking about chemistry. So we'll be moving on to chapter two um, in your textbook. Also remember that you can get an, uh, probably a printed copy of it. Has anybody gone to the bookstore and got a printed copy of it? They're, do they have several still available? Yeah, and they're super nice. Like, oh, good. Not, I've printed copies before and they, they cut off like. Yeah, these are actually professionally done. They outsourced them. <laughs> yeah, OK, great. Okay, so also remember that you have your practice homework that is due, that is tomorrow. So tomorrow by midnight, you wanna go in and do your practice homework. And remember that it doesn't matter if you get them all wrong or if you get them all right. I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna adjust everybody's score. So as long as you do the practice homework, you can get five points, right? It's not like the end of the world if you do not do your practice homework. Yes? So you don't have access because? Okay, so it might be that we actually um, need to, um, I need to get your name and your ID and I will contact um, directly because it might be that it's not going to automatically load. Who else is in that position where they, they are on the wait list and okay. So just write down your name and your ID and then just hand it to me at the end of class and I can um, send an email out to the person that needs to get that done. Okay, and then your online homework and your introductions are due on Sunday night at midnight. If you miss lecture one, the lecture one is available for viewing, and so it is a YouTube video. So when you click on it, you could watch it as a tiny little video, which you probably don't want to do, right? You could then just do full screen, right? And so that's the, you know, we talked about Canvas, oops, first thing. So that will be um, recorded. And so I tried to record all the lectures, although sometimes the technology or the website's not up and running, but hopefully most of the lectures will be recorded. Okay, are there any questions before we continue today? So we learned a little bit of about biology and living things. And so I have like three questions here. And remember that your first quiz is on Monday. And it is going to be only over the information that was presented in lecture um, from Monday and today. So it'll be next Monday will be your first quiz. Um, and so what do you think would be the answer to this question? Does anybody know? No. No. C. Okay. So this is like one of the most like amazing things, right? We talked about this, but you still are a little confused, right? So this carbon dioxide, there's mass in our atmosphere. There's little pieces of material in our atmosphere, right? And carbon is what makes up the majority of an, or of an organic living thing, right? So it's the carbon dioxide molecules in the air that are captured during photosynthesis and then put into an organic molecule. So when you think about like the fiber of the plant, if you think about like dead wood and you're burning it, you're actually breaking up the, the carbon um, and it's being released and energy is being released as heat, right? So it's the carbon dioxide molecules in the air that make up the mass, the material. Okay, so that's a little bit different from energy. Remember, energy is needed to capture the carbon from the atmosphere. There are some nutrients in the soil, like nitrogen and phosphorus, which they need, but that's not the that's not the majority of the mass. And you know, if you dry out, a plant dies and it dries out, it still has mass, even if all the water has evaporated from it. Okay. Enzymes, are they living or non-living? 
non-living. And why are they non-living? What are they not? What do they not do? They do not grow. They do not reproduce. They are not composed of cells. They do not acquire energy and material from their environment. They do not respond, right? They do not adapt, okay? So enzymes are, um, it's important to realize that enzymes are organic molecules. They can be active or not active but they are definitely not living. Okay. So they don't have those characteristics of life that we talked about. Okay, so photosynthesis is a series of chemical reactions that produces what as a waste product? Oxygen, right? So sometimes they call the forest the lungs of the, of the earth, right? Because they are taking in carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen. So um, we then take that oxygen in, right? And we use it to internally combust um, energy inside of our body to produce the energy that is necessary to keep us alive, right? So uh, plants use oxygen, or they actually, they don't use oxygen, sorry. They produce oxygen. Okay. okay. Oops, switch. Uh, oh, here I know. Topic. Here we go. Okay, so we are going to just finish the information, talking about the information in chapter one. Let me just fast forward through here. Okay. So in chapter one and in the lab this uh, week, we talked about the scientific method. And um, in the scientific method, we have experimentation. And we are going to be doing some experiments this right. So we're gonna be doing lots of experiments this quarter. And with experimentation, we have variables. Now these variables have names that you need to learn. So the variables include the independent variable. Okay. This is what you alter. Okay, so this is what you change in your experiment. Then you have the dependent variable. This is what you measure. So some way to remember this is that the dependent variable is going to depend on what you have altered. So what you measure is going to depend on what you're altering. So that's why it's called the dependent. So it's dependent upon the variables that you're altering. And then we have what are referred to as control variables. Or a control variables. They're generally more than just one. Right? So this is everything you keep constant. So let's just look at an example of this as it relates to what I will call the nitrogen cycle. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, so this is the background information about this example. So nitrogen is actually the most abundant element in our atmosphere. So it is even more abundant than carbon. So we have carbon dioxide, but we have nitrogen gas. And nitrogen gas is in a form where there's three nitrogen atoms that are bonded together. So this is nitrogen gas. Now, um, the interesting thing about this is this is super stable in the atmosphere, right? 
It makes up like 70% of the gases. Okay. It's super stable, and so it's not readily, easily taken out of the atmosphere and put into living things. Okay. So we can talk about what is called nitrogen fixation. So this is taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere and putting it into organic molecules. So nitrogen fixing, fixation can only be done by a particular few living organisms. Animals cannot fix nitrogen. We breathe in the nitrogen, but it's so stable that we just breathe it right back out. Plants would really like to be able to fix nitrogen, but they can't by themselves. And so what um, organism is able, able to nitrogen fix would include the bacteria. Okay. So this bacteria can be in the soil, or it can also be in the water. So it could be like cyanobacteria in the water. So bacteria are responsible for the majority of, of the activity of taking nitrogen out. And we actually need this nitrogen, right? We get it by eating plants, but plants need the nitrogen, right, by getting it in the soil. So the bacteria fix it, then release it into the soil, and then the plants can take it back up, okay? So that is a really um, interesting idea. Now there are some uh, plants that you sometimes hear you say, oh, this plant is a nitrogen fixator. So what plants, the Zinnervidian egg, would know, like if you were going to plant a crop of plants that are, are they say that are, that are nitrogen fixers, what would you, what kind of plant would you plant? Does anybody know? Yes, alfalfa is one. It's a larger group of peas, lentils, peanuts, right? All of those are legumes, right? So these are nitrogen-fixing plants, but they don't do them by the by the by itself. Uh, nitrogen-fixing plants do to symbiotic bacteria in root nodules okay. so it's not the legumes it's not the pigment it's not the alfalfa that is fixing the nitrogen it's just that that particular type of plant developed a strategy for housing bacteria in their root nodules. And so they are more likely to get the nitrogen than a plant that say like wheat, that doesn't, is not a nitrogen fixing plant. So wheat does not have symbiotic bacteria in it. So sometimes you, um, when you plant these, you actually add, you can, you can buy the, sim, the symbiotic bacteria. If you have uh, like, soil that you've never gardened with before and you can actually add the bacteria to the soil and you can tell whether or not your legumes are doing well because you can see right you can see this and so like if you pulled up a early pea plant and you looked at it it would have these little nodules on it and these are little places that house the symbiotic bacteria so the question is we want to talk about um um, if we and you can sometimes see that people have a strategy of planting cover crops and so even here they might plant a cover crop of peas so sometimes you go out in the wheat fields and there's peas growing you're like whoa that's weird right but what they're doing is they're they're trying to in, they're trying to increase the nitrogen content in the soil okay so the question that we would have Oops. Does a cover crop increase 
the growth of wheat in the subsequent year. Okay. So the cover crop would be peas or the alfalfa, right? And so then we would develop a hypothesis, right? And so that's an educated guess. And so now we know that if a cover crop is a legume, right, we would say yes. So we predict that if we planted a cover crop and then we planted wheat, that the wheat would, would better, better be able to grow. Okay, so that would be the educated guess, would be that yes, it does. Okay, then how would we design an experiment? What would be the independent variable? The cover crop or not, right? So cover crop versus no cover crop. So you take two fields. One you would just plow under and you would just leave it fallow. So you see all these like fields of dirt, right? They're waiting for the next season to be planted, right? Versus a cover crop where you would add, right? So that would be the independent variable. So write down independent variable. And then what would you measure? What? Growth, okay. So you'd measure growth of wheat. So you might measure how fast it grows, you might measure the yield, right? So how much grain you get from the, from the wheat, okay? Now, what would you have to keep constant? The wheat. The type of wheat, excellent. So the type of wheat. How about what else? Weather. Weather. So you maybe you wouldn't want them really far apart because one might get more water than the other, more precipitation. What about fertilizer? Right. You would want to probably maybe not fertilize either one of them, right? So you would not want to like fertilize the one that doesn't have a cover crop because that's just adding inorganic nitrogen, right? So that's just adding nitrogen to the soil. So you would want to control all the other variables that would um, affect the growth of the wheat. So that's the idea of a using the scientific method. Okay. Now, in um, biology, when we use the scientific method, oops, oftentimes we talk about scientific theories. Okay. And so I'm going to put this versus laws. So when you take a physics class or a chemistry class, they'll talk about the law, the law of thermodynamics, for example, right? So they have lots of laws. But in biology, for some reason, we kind of stay away from the idea of we don't have a lot of laws, right? I don't even know of one law that we have. So instead of laws, we have theories, right? So theories are not educated guesses. So a scientific theory is a well-developed, well-developed, so it's a well-developed idea. It is well-tested, right? And it is kind of universally accepted within the field of science, okay? So when I talk about theory in my everyday language, I'll say, I have a theory that if I, um, if I, what's what we get theory? I have any recent theories that I always, that I'm living by, I'm always testing. Um, oh, I here's a good one. So I have this theory that if I clean the house and straighten it before um, my children um, get home from school, that they'll actually create less of a mess, right? So if they actually come home to a relatively clean house, they create less of a mess because they're like, oh, we got to keep this place clean, right? 
as, as opposed to if I just let everything, you know, I just don't clean up, then they come home and they're like, they make big, huge messes because it's, it's kind of hidden by the mess that's already there, right? So that's my theory, right? But that's not how we use theories in, in science, okay? A theory is not a hypothesis. So technically, I should say, I hypothesize that if I clean up my house, my kids will make fewer messes, right? So um, that's um, the difference. So scientific theories are not the same as way, the way we use them. So when we talk about the theory of evolution, it's not like we just, you know, we have this hypothesis that things change over time. It's really that it's a well-developed, well-tested, and universally accepted idea, okay? So just as an example of some theories in biology, okay, there's the cell theory. You don't need to know all of these. I just want to give you some examples. You don't need to write this down. So that all organism, organisms are made of cells. And we also talked about this idea that today, all cells come from pre-existing cells. That we do not have cells and like microbes spontaneously arising. They have to come from someplace. So they arose long, 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 you know, billions of years ago and, and they have a lineage, right? Homeostasis, that's a theory, gene, ecosystem, evolution, right? So all things have a common ancestor. That is a scientific theory, which is, which is you know, at the same par as all these other things, okay? So it's just important to realize that um, the hypothesis and the theory are very different. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to talk about in chapter um, one is the taxonomic classification of life. And so this is a hierarchy, which means that this classification scheme starts really big and then it narrows down to the specific. So when we look at the biggest classification, we have what is called the domain, right? So that includes, in our domain is eukarya, right? I think that's how it's spelled. I think that's one. Anyway, so this refers to the fact that we are eukaryotic organisms. Does anybody know what that means? Exactly. Okay. So carry means nuts or nucleus, and so you means good. So you know people hate biology because of the language, right? But once you start to get the hang of it, it's like, oh, I know what they're talking about. So good nucleus. So our cells have a nucleus. So we are not in the same domain as bacteria because bacteria do not have a nucleus. They are actually prokaryotic. So we are in this different domain, domain, okay? Then we have the phylum. Okay, so we're actually, we're gonna do humans. See if we can figure out where, how we would classify a human, okay? Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah, oh, you're right. Thank you. I'll just cross that out. Okay, so kingdom. Thank you. So we have animalia. Okay, the plants are in a different kingdom. We are in the kingdom of animalia. Okay, phylum. So this is for humans. So we are in the phylum with all the other vertebrates, but that's not the name of the phylum. The name of the phylum is Chordata. Okay. So you don't really need to remember these. The thing that you do need to remember, like what I did made a mistake here, is the order. Okay. So this would include the vertebrates. Okay. So this includes all the organisms with a vertebral column. So if we look at all the invertebrates, that would include lizards, amphibians, birds, and mammals. So we are actually in the class mammalia. 
right? So we are a mammal. They just um, reclassified birds. Birds are um, used to be in their own class. Now they put them in with the reptiles. So birds are actually in the class reptilia. So this is, these um, classifications are kind of academic in what kind of what, and based upon evidence. And so they're a little, you can change things that go into what class. Okay, so kingdom, phylum, class, order. We are of a mammal, what kind of mammal are we? Um, no, we are with the chimpanzee and the orangutan and the um, primates. Excellent. So that'd be primata. We are also have a family. The family, has anybody taken um, anthropology? and the study of early man. What family are we in? We are actually in hominidae. Hominidae. So we are hominids. There are no other hominids on the planet right now. Right? There were hominids in the past. And then we are in the genus. There were others than us. We are in the genus. What's our genus? Does anybody know? It's it's the first part of our species name. Homo. So we're the only species within the genus Homo because um, there used to be one that was called Homo erectus, Homo habilis, but we are not called Homo erectus. We're not called Homo habilis. What are we called? Sapiens, okay? So that's the species name. So notice how we went from very inclusive and we got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So these two, the last two, okay, um, are the name of the species and the name of the species is a type of binomial nomenclature. Okay. So two names. So the genus is always uppercase okay so that's really important the species name is always lowercase okay that's important that's lowercase sapiens and then this is always either underlined or italicized so if you're looking at um, a scientific research paper and it's talking about a, like a type of lizard and you see this weird, you know, Latin name, and it looks like this, and it's italicized or it's underlined. You know that that is the species name, and so you can pick them out really fast. And that species name is the same no matter what language you speak. Um, although I'm always curious about like Japanese or Chinese, how do they write it? But like, if I was going to um, uh, talk about it in German or French or Spanish, it would be the same. Right? So like for example, there's a species of damselfly. So here's another example. Oops, damselfly. And they, one example of this is this there, there's a species, one of the most, uh, in a, in a, oops, I can remember how to spell it. That's an analegma. You don't need to memorize that either, but this is just an example. So if I'm working on a, um, this is actually my the species that I worked on as a master's, right? So in a legma civili, right? That is a specific type of damselfly. It's considered to be the coyote of damselflies because it's the most common and it's found like everywhere. Okay, so that's the taxonomic classification. So we're talking about a specific um, and you, this can even actually go to bacteria. So you can talk about E. coli. E. coli is a, a specific strain of bacteria. 
there any questions about that idea? So we are going to be moving on. Oh, so this is in your book, right? So this is actually talking about um, the species of wolf. No, is this the common see, Canis lupus? Dogs and wolves. Oh, so dogs and wolves are the same species, right? Because they get each breed. Oh, I wanted to repass this question. Okay, so let's say you're watching a scientific or a science fiction, sorry, a science fiction film, and they're talking about like Star Trek. So I think I'm sure this came up in Star Trek. So they're talking about different life forms, and what are they sometimes imagined as being based on instead of carbon? So we're carbon-based creatures. So what do you think? What have you maybe heard of before during the scientific? Or not science, science fiction fans out there. You want to take a wild guess? Wasn't like Superman based on Krypton or something? Okay, Krypton is kryptonite, gives him his power, but it's like just radioactive rock. So he's not actually built of it, he's not actually made of it. So it's got to be something that's relatively stable. Iron. Not iron. Hey, think of Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say sulfur, but it's not on there. Iron is a mineral. And it does not readily combine with anything else. E. E. Not cadmium. Silicon. Okay. So this is the correct answer. Okay. And we're going to look at why. Right. So why would science fiction nerds think they could use substitutes, silicon, for carbon? And the answer is, is that they behave very similar due to their atomic structure. So chapter two, chemistry. So really to understand genetics and to understand cell biology, we need a little background in chemistry. So remember that we were talking about the elements and what mnemonic device did I give you to remember the most common elements? Schnapps. Carbon, hydrogen, Nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, schnapps. Okay. Remember that each one of these is an element that is the carbon, is an element that is composed of one type, specific type of atom. Okay. So when we look at atoms, they are the basic unit of matter. They have a nucleus, and within this nucleus, they have two subatomic particles, the proton, which has a positive charge, and the neutron, which because it's neutral, has no charge. Okay. Proton, positive, P, positive, neutron, neutral, zero. Okay. Now, surrounding this nucleus is a orbit or a shell or a cloud, right? So there's lots of different ways to, you know, this is something that we cannot see. So there's lots of different ways to think about this, what surrounds the nucleus. So it could be like a cloud of energy, right? But what type of particle is in the orbit, the shell, or the cloud? Does anybody know? electron and they have a negative charge okay. so generally if we're looking at an atom that has no charge to it the protons and the electrons are going to be equal okay. so like an atom that doesn't have doesn't have a positive or a negative charge the protons and the electrons will cancel each other out okay so let's look at carbon. Okay. So C is the letter for carbon, and then you see the six, this number up above. 
This is important because this is what we call the atomic number. The atomic number is defined by the number of protons. So there are six protons in carbon. The bottom number, sometimes it's written right underneath or sometimes it's off to the side, is the atomic mass. So that's how much it weighs. And you'll notice that it's exactly double. So the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Because each of those have a unit of mass of one. So the protons plus the neutrons is the atomic mass. Now notice that the electrons are not added into the mass because they are super small. They could be just waves of energy, or they could be particles. You can view them both ways, depending upon what your interest is. And so they essentially have no mass. The electrons have no mass. Okay. So if we look at um, this atom inside the nucleus, right? we would have six protons and six neutrons. That is in the center of the atom. Now surrounding the atom is an orbit. So I'm gonna draw my orbit, I'm gonna draw two orbits, one that's close in and one that's further away. Okay. So those are the orbits. Now, the first orbit or shell can only contain two electrons. Like the size of it can only contain two electrons. And then the subsequent orbits can, are big enough that they'll fit eight electrons. Okay? So how many electrons do you think carbon has? If it's neutral. It's not positive or negative. How many electrons would it have? Six, right? Because it has six protons, six positive charges. It has to have six negative charges to balance it out. Does everybody see that? Okay. So I'm going to just draw them as little circles, right? So this would be an electron. An electron. Okay. And I'm drawing it as two-dimensional, but you have to think about it as like a balloon. It's like a three-dimensional you know, or maybe an onion with a center and then shells, okay? So since two fit in, then we would have how many on the outside shell? Four, right? So we'd have one, two, three, and four. So four electrons on the outside shell. Okay. Okay. So um, there are... Um, elements that have their outer shell filled. And there are elements that do not have their outer shell filled. So is carbon an element that has the total number, does it have the second shell completely filled? No, right? So let's write that down. And there's a rule here and it's called the octet rule if you wanna remember. I'll never ask you that particular, but the octet rule says, that there are each shell after the first can hold eight electrons. Okay. So we have some elements that are reactive. So we can talk about them as reactive atoms. This is where the outer shell is not filled. Okay. And so what happens is, is that carbon would like to fill its outer shell because it would be more stable. And so what happens is, is that it will form bonds and share electrons with other elements. So for example, just to simply write um, carbon here, it could share an electron with hydrogen. Right? 
So this just shows a molecule where carbon is sharing an electron with hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. This is stable. This is actually called CH4. Does anybody know what CH4 is? This is methane. So methane is a gas. So they worry about uh, dairies because the cows are releasing so much gas into the atmosphere, right? Methane can be stored underground, and then they're finding that when the permafrost is melting, you have these huge methane releases into the atmosphere. Methane, unfortunately, is also a greenhouse gas with along with um, carbon dioxide, and so it contributes to climate warming because of this greenhouse gas. The carbon is a reactive atom. So this is versus an inert atom. Okay, this is where the outer shell is filled. Okay, and it is inert, meaning that it does not like to interact with other atoms. So a good example of this is helium. This is also a gas. We put it in balloons to make them float, so it's very light. But it's also very flammable, which was why the big, what was that called? Hindenburg blimp. The big blimp, right, went up when it got, when they had that spark. Okay. So if we look at helium, helium is this. How many protons does it have? Oh, sorry, it's not four, so it should be four. How many protons does it have? Two. How many electrons does it have? Two, right? So its first shell is filled. How many neutrons does it have? Two. Okay, so there's two protons. This is the atomic number. Since it's four, we know that it has to have two neutrons. And in order for it to be not a positive or negative, it's got to have two electrons, okay? So that's helium. Okay. There is another element that is very close to helium, which is hydrogen. Okay. So how many protons does hydrogen have? One. How many neutrons does hydrogen have? Zero. Zero, right? So it just has one proton. It has no neutrons. And it's got one le electron. So it's just a proton and then one electron. And is hydrogen reactive or inert? Does it have its outer shell filled? No. No, right? So it's reactive, so it's going to want to share its electrons. So it can fill its outer shell, because here carbon's outer shell is filled, and so is hydrogen's, because they're sharing the extra electron. Right. OK. So the this information about protons and electrons can be found in what is called the periodic table. Where's my periodic table? Oh, I don't have it. Does anybody have the book? Can you look up silicon for me? No, I want to, where, where, what is the number of SI? Actually, I could probably find it here too. Okay, so SI is 14. And, well, okay, so we'll just do 28. Okay. So this is silicon. This is not isotopes yet, so just kind of ignore that. This should be up there with helium and hydrogen, okay? So we have 14, so there's here's my nucleus. I have two here. I have eight here. And then I have what here? So that adds up to 14, right? So you notice that it is very similar to carbon, right? It has only half of its outer shell is filled, 
And so silicon would combine with other elements really easily, and it might behave just like, just like, um, just like carbon. Okay. So there's some reasons why it won't work very well, but and why we might not see it on a on a planet life forms based upon silica, but it could be right. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so isotopes are very interesting because they are types of atoms that are radioactive and are releasing energy. So isotopes, by definition, have the same number of protons, so atoms with same number of protons, but different neutron, different number of neutrons. Oops, oops, neutrons. Okay. So carbon is normally this. But in the atmosphere, it actually, in some cases, is this. So what this means is, is that this carbon has not the same number of protons, not the same, excuse me, not the same number of neutrons, right? It has the same number of protons, but look at here, there's eight instead of six, there's eight neutrons, okay? So this is going to be unstable, and it is going to decay over time. Living organisms like even you have this in your body, but once you die, the carbon-14 that is in your body is going to start to decay into a different element. So you can look at the relative amounts of carbon-14 in um, rocks or in fossils, and you can date them to when they die. And that is what is referred to as carbon-14 dating. Okay? So if you've taken anthropology, you probably talked a lot about this, or even geology, they talk a lot about it because it's the way that they date um, fossils to find out when they died. And it, you can't go back too many years. Gosh, I wish I knew the number of years, but I don't. It's, it only goes back a certain amount of time. And then it, it's not relevant because um, it would have been too long and all the car carbon-14 would disappear. So that's just an example of one way that we use isotopes. We also use isotopes to um, track molecules, okay? So we have this one. We can also use So like if we wanted to track a water molecule, you could use what is called heavy water. Which um, has um, a hydrogen that is H21, right? So heavy water has heavy hydrogen in it. So instead of just having one um, proton and, and zero, this one would actually have an extra neutron, right? And so you can use radioactive elements, you put them in the body, and you can watch where the energy goes, right? You can watch where this, this, this um, uh, molecule of hydrogen, where it goes in the body. So it's really uh, useful in biochemistry. There's another um, type of um, isotope that is called, this is called deuterium, that is called tritium. And this is where you have an extra two neutrons. So this is called tritium. And what tritium does is it decays and releases energy and then we can use it to uh, excite fluorescent molecules so it causes it to glow. So these glowing watches, glow-in-the-dark watches, for example, 
use a tritium in them. So if you've ever had a, a watch, it's not battery powered, but kind of looks like this. Right? They have tritium in here, and tritium is decaying and it's releasing energy, and it's causing the fluorescence to um, occur. But it's not enough energy that it's going to like give you cancer, right? And these were really common. I don't you know when I was a kid. It's like, ooh, 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 Okay, and then obviously isotopes can be used for bad things, right? So we can use them as nuclear weapons with uranium or plutonium. Um, and, um, but they can use, be also used medicinally and in um, creating energy, as in um, nuclear power plants. Okay. okay, so that's the idea of isotopes. Okay, so let's talk about the energy. So we talked about potential and kinetic energy. So potential is energy is that which is stored. And we can actually store energy in the atom. And then when we break the atom apart or if we break a molecule apart, we break a bond, we can release that energy. Okay. So if we have the nucleus, we have the first shell and the second shell and the third shell, okay? So I'm gonna say that this is my positive charge. And I want you to kind of think of this as like two magnets that are being attracted to one another, okay? So I have an electron here. And it is really close to its positive charge. But if I put energy into this atom, I can make this electron move to a higher energy state, right? If I pull apart my magnets, I have created potential energy, right? So this actually stores energy. So if I pull the electron a little bit away from the nucleus, I am going to store energy in that atom and in that molecular bond. If it's a bond that's causing that pulling. Okay. It can also go the opposite way. So you could have an electron here and it could go down, right? So it could go closer. And so it would be like if you have a magnet and you let them come close, right? And you keep them, but you keep them from coming together. That's releasing energy. So this releases energy. So let's say we have um, an organic molecule that might look like this. Okay. So this is actually propane. So the stuff that you put into your um, your grill, your propane tank, right, is um, a hydrocarbon. So this is a hydrocarbon, and we have energy stored in the bonds between these molecules, okay? You can um, combust, right? So when I when I want to start a fire, what thing, what do I need? I need a, probably a spark, but what else do I need if I'm going to start a fire? How do I combust this and release the energy? What other uh, gas do I need? I'll give you an example. Oxygen, right? So oxygen has to be present in order for burning to take place. Right. And I'm not going to, this is, I'm not going to, um, if you've had chemistry before, I'm not going to balance this equation, so don't worry about that. Okay. okay. So this, we go in this direction, and we have CO2 being released. We have H2O being produced, and we have energy, right? So we're producing carbon dioxide. If there's not enough oxygen, I'll produce carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous oxygen, really bad. See, that's why you want to burn with plenty of oxygen, right? 
go take your charcoal grill inside to your house. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm breaking the bonds here, and the electrons are moving closer to the atom, and I'm forming new bonds here, but the output is energy. So this could be heat. This could be fire. Right. So I'm releasing the stored energy in the chemical bonds. The electrons are moving, and energy is being released. In order to get it to go the other way, we have to put energy into the system to get it to go that way. Does that make, kind of make sense to everybody? Okay, so these are all of the schnapps. Okay. One thing that you'll notice about all the schnapps atoms is, is that they are all, are all reactive. They all have their outer shell only partially filled. And that means that they're going to form bonds with other elements. Okay. So we're going to talk about the types of bonds that we see between atoms. So the first type of bond that we're going to talk about is the ionic bonds. And ionic bonds are the exchange of electrons between atoms. Sorry, exchange of electrons between atoms. And oftentimes what happens is, is that this exchange of electrons gives you a positive and negative and then creates an attraction between oppositely charged particles. Okay. We'll put ions. We'll talk about what an ion is in a second. Okay. So a good example of this is sodium plus chloride. Okay. Now we can make what is called elemental sodium. It is really something you do not want to mess with because it is a silver. It's a silver and it's a solid and it's really soft. But it will, you don't touch it with your hands because it is going to want to give up an electron, and so it is going to like burn you big time. Right? So this is a, a solid, a metallic solid. What about elemental chlorine or chloride? That is a gas. That's a yellow gas, and you don't want to drink that or not drink it. You don't want to breathe it because you will die. Okay? So these two things in their elemental form are toxic. And the reason is, is, is that they're unstable, and they're going to want to give up or receive an electron to fill their outer shell. Okay. So if we look at a um, picture of this, okay. so this is my elemental sodium. This is my elemental chloride right there. Right? If we look at them, notice how sodium has this lone electron it's going to want to give that electron up okay, to your cells, right? That would be bad energy. This one is missing an electron. There should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This electron is going to go there, and there's going to be an exchange. So this chemical reaction is going to produce its heat. So it goes... It's like, if you did it in underneath a, or in a demonstration, it would produce a lot of heat and it would like sound like a little reaction. And that's because that electron is moving right? and it's releasing energy as it moves. And then being drawn back in. So this is table salt, right? We eat this. We have this in our body. This is salt water. This is table salt, right, that we take in, okay? So it's a very different thing when you have that ionic bond. Okay, so here, oops, here just shows the exchange. Okay, 
Now notice that they're now ions. So an ion is a charged particle, right? So sodium is ion, chloride is an ion. You don't need to know that they're, they're, they're named differently depending upon whether they're positive or charged, you just need to know those are ions. Okay. The next type of bond we've actually already talked about, which is covalence. So covalent is where electrons are shared between atoms. And there's two different types. There is nonpolar covalent. So when you think about polarity, you generally think of like there was polar opposites. Right, they're very different, right? And so that nonpolar means there's no difference. And so this is where the electrons are shared equally. There's no difference in the distribution of charge. So electrons are shared equally. Okay. Nonpolar. So that's very different from polar, where the electrons are not equally shared. Sorry about that, that's a C, are not equally shared. Okay. What molecule is this? Oxygen gas, right? So this is what we breathe in, right? So this would be O2, right? Do you think that this is a polar or nonpolar covalent bond? So covalent bonds are always a solid line. You know that they're always a solid line. This means that they're sharing two different electrons. Do you think they would be sharing them equally or not? Equally, right? Because it's two oxygen. So these are equally pulling, right? Because they're actually the same, right? Okay. So then what is this? Yeah, so what is that? Water. Water, okay? So that's H2O, okay? Do you think that the hydrogen and the oxygen are sharing electrons equally? We know that there's only one proton in hydrogen, probably more in oxygen. Right? So the oxygen would be drawing the electrons that would be stronger because it has more protons. So it's going to be drawing them towards it. So we would say that this is slightly negative and these are positive, okay? So we would say that that is a, those covalent bonds, those lines are polar covalent bonds because the electrons are not being shared equally. So this actually comes to the very last type of bonding. So we had ionic, we had covalent, and then we have hydrogen bonding. Now hydrogen bonding is kind of a misnomer because it doesn't have to be hydrogen. It doesn't even have to involve a hydrogen atom. But when we first discovered it in biology, um, we called it hydrogen because that is what happens between two water molecules. So these two, if we put in two, two water molecules together, so let me just put one here and one here. Right? What's going to happen is, is that there is going to be a weak attraction between these two water molecules okay? because of the difference in charge. So hydrogen bonding is a dotted line. Anytime you see a dotted line in a molecule, that is a hydrogen bond, whether it involves hydrogen or not, okay? It's a dotted line. 
And because it's a dotted line, this emphasizes the fact that it is a weak bond that can be broken. We can break this bond, but it takes energy. So if you think about water, if you have a pot of water, the liquid water, there's all these hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. When you heat up the water and you produce steam, you're not breaking this bond. That would release a huge amount of energy and that would be very bad, right? You're breaking this bond. So when water goes from a liquid to a steam, you're just breaking the hydrogen bonds. Okay? And then the water molecules go up and become part of the vapor. So they tend to be weak. But interestingly, we have hydrogen bonding in our DNA, which explains how the DNA unwinds and the two strands separate during replication of new genetic material. We also have DNA in our proteins, and that is the reason, or excuse me, hydrogen bonding in our proteins, and that is the way, reason why proteins fold in a particular way is because of hydrogen bonding. Okay. Okay, we talked about that. We talked about hydrogen bonds in water. Okay. So the last thing we'll talk about are the properties of water that make it so unique, okay? So it is a polar molecule. It has a high heat of vaporization. Okay. What that means is it takes a lot of energy to go from a liquid to a gas. Okay, that is important because if you think about alcohol, so if you think about rubbing alcohol and you leave the cap off your rubbing alcohol and then a week later you come back, what will have happened? It will have turned into a gas. So it has evaporated and gone off, right? And you're left with like an empty alcohol bottle, okay? So alcohol has a low heat of vaporization Water has a high heat of vaporization, and this is good because we can use it for evaporative cooling. Okay, so mammals in specific, in specific, right? So we sweat, for example. So the heat in our surface of our skin hopefully will be will be used to break this, the water molecules apart and heat will be released as the, the water evaporates off our bodies. And so it's kind of some interesting, some we are really good sweaters, right? We can sweat a lot and cool up our body. Other mammals, not so much, right? So if you think about your cat or your dog, how do they how do they get rid of their heat? their tongue, right? Imagine having to pant when you're hot. I mean, I just think that would be a miserable way to do it. <laughs> Kangaroos have a really interesting solution. They do not sweat, but they don't pant. They have this big patch of hairless area on their, um, their forearms, and they lick. So they lick their forearms. So be our equivalent of like running your forearms under water and going like this, right? They lick their forearms and then they go like this and it evaporates off and it cools them down. So sweating was really important. You can, you can imagine if you couldn't sweat how dangerous that would be, okay? It is also important because it prevents or keeps water on the planets, right? So it keeps liquid water on planet, right? If it was some other, if we had to rely upon something else besides water to carry stuff in the solution, it would be really bad because it might all evaporate and it'll be gone and we'd never be able to get it back, right? 
Okay, so that's one characteristic of water, right? So actually, we have one, it's polar, two, okay? The third thing is, is that it is considered to be a universal solvent. Okay. So next week in lab, we're going to create some solutions. So a solution is, sorry, a solvent plus the solute. Okay. That should be an arrow, not a little weird squiggly line. This is just an arrow. Right? So our in our body, our solvent is water. And it carries and transports things in solution. So for example, sodium and chloride are not in a crystal form in your body. They are in solution, right? So it pulls um, molecules apart. Okay, so ions like Sodium and chloride are transported in solution. Right? So ions like these two are transported in solution. So um, something really interesting is sometimes we have to transport fats in our body. So um, fats are not soluble in water. So if you were gonna like try to transport uh, fat or like cholesterol, cholesterol's not, if you're gonna try to transport it in water, it would not go into solution. So we have a, a solution for that. We actually um, take our fats and we cover them, our body covers them in protein so that they will go into solution. So we have to have things that help to transport cholesterol in our body. So that is a third significance of water. Okay. Four is that it is less dense as a solid than a liquid. Right? And you've all experienced this, putting your soda can in the freezer and having it explode. Right. That's because when the water freezes, it expands, right, and, the, and it destroys the can, right? So this is important because what this means is, is that ice floats, right? So when a river or a, a, or a um, pond or a lake starts to freeze, it freezes and then the ice floats up and then the ice insulates the water underneath it. So bodies of water freeze from the top down. Okay. And so what that means is that there's oftentimes water running underneath the ice in a river. You know, it doesn't, rivers don't generally freeze completely solid unless it's really cold, right? And generally in a, in a pond or a lake, the, only the first couple of feet might be frozen, and then underneath that, the fish can survive, right? So it kind of keeps, it allows organisms to survive underneath the water. And then finally, fifth thing, is that water is cohesive and adhesive. Okay, cohesive means that it clings together to itself, right? And adhesive means it adheres to something else. So this would be itself, and this is something else, so it, clings to itself and then clings to something else. Okay. So you probably have all experienced the adhesive part if you're playing with a straw. So if you stick your straw in your drink and then you close off the end, the water will kind of get sucked up and it will cling to the side of the straw, right? And you're like, yes, I can lift my straw up and the water is still in there, right? Because it's adhering to that, okay? So um, that is really important because we have little tiny vessels, and it's really important capillary reaction, really important for it to the water to adhere to these vessels. And 
like we saw in the rainforest, the trees actually rely upon this idea of cohesiveness because as water evaporates off the top of them, they suck the water in through their roots. And there's a continual column of water as the water is drawn up and then out. And so the idea of the, of the plant moving water um, through its cohesive nature is significant. Okay, so we'll stop there for today. And then on Monday, we're going to have very first thing, a 15 point quiz. And then we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more about chemistry and about pH in particular. Is the quiz going to be over chapter one and chapter two? It's, it's going to be over my lecture material. Okay.